Abdullah II ascended Jordan's throne just over 16 years ago. And there arguably has never been a more tense time during his reign. By the UN's count, there were more than 800,000 refugees in Jordan in January. Some say the number is higher. One refugee camp is now the fourth biggest city in Jordan. Outside Jordan's borders, it has ISIS in Iraq and Syria, which has spilled over into Lebanon and Turkey, and now perhaps even further afield. It has the Palestinian problem in Israel and the West Bank right next door. Most recently, Abdullah has had to lead his nation through the sadness and anger that flowed from the brutal murder of one of the nation's Air Force pilots by ISIS. We met in the Al Husseinia Palace in Jordan's capital, Amman. Your Majesty, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here, Farid. Thank you. This is the first time you're speaking to the world since the, uh, the death of the uh, Jordanian pilot and that brutal uh, video. Tell us what was your reaction when you first saw the video? Well, uh, in actual fact, I, I didn't see the video, and um, uh, um, I, uh, many of us refused to see what I think is, is um, propaganda. Um, obviously, I had uh, uh, a detailed brief of what happened. Uh, we, we couldn't escape seeing, obviously, pictures in the newspapers. Um, uh, discuss uh, sadness to, to the family. Um, I had met the family on many occasions. My heart went out to, to the father, the mother, uh, the brothers, the sisters, uh, his wife. Um, they'd only been married for, for five months. Uh, anger as a, as a son of, uh, of uh, the Arab army, the Jordanian armed forces. Uh, Mu'ad, um, uh, God bless his soul, is, uh, uh, is a brother in arms. And so I think um, all Jordanian soldiers, uh, past and present, uh, were angered and disgusted by the brutality of uh, of what uh, Mu'adh was put through. Um, and I think uh, if um, ISIS or Daesh, as we call them, um, tried to intimidate uh, Jordanians, I think it just had the reverse effect. Um, uh, if you look at our history, we're a country that's used to being outgunned and outnumbered, and um, um, we've always punched way above our weight. Um, and I think, if anything, uh, Daesh has now got a sort of a, a tiger by the tail. Um, and uh, it, it just motivated Jordanians to sort of rally around the flag um, and the gloves have come off. What do you think they were trying to do with the, with the video? With the... They're always trying to intimidate, uh, scare, put fear um, uh, into uh, uh, people's hearts. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a, a, a group that uh, works by intimidations. Um, they're, they're trying to uh, invent uh, falsely um, a, a linkage to a, a, a caliphate, a, a caliphate um, linked to, to our history in Islam, which has no truth or bearing to, to, to our history, um, to, to bring in um, deluded young men and women that think that this is a, a sort of an Islamic um, 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 uh, uh, nation, and it has nothing to do with, 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 our, with our history. And actually, the barbarity of, of the way they executed uh, 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 our uh, brave hero, I think, shocked the, the, the Muslim world, and specifically uh, Jordanians and people from this region, that it had nothing to do with Islam. Um, and it's this intimidation that I think they use as their major weapon. The Jordanian government promised an earth-shattering response, earth-shaking response, as I recall. Um, so far, what we've seen hasn't quite seemed that dramatic. Is there more to come? Is how should we interpret what's well, going to happen? You know, earth-shattering is 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 uh, from all uh, military um, capabilities. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, there has been a, a, a massive response uh, from from air campaign. Um, there are continued operations uh, uh, going on um, uh, in Syria. Uh, we are coordinating with our friends uh, in, in Iraq, um, and there is a long-term approach to this issue. Um, and uh, again, uh, this is one of the issues that I'd like to point out to you. I mean, one of the things that uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, ISIS and Daesh have been saying is why is it that, uh, that uh, we are being picked on by fellow Muslims? Why did the Jordanians get involved in this, in this war? Well, this has been our war. It has been our war for, for a long time against these people that, for lack of a better term, many of us are calling Khawarij. These are uh, outlaws, in a way, uh, in, of Islam that um, 
uh, have been trying to use expansionist policy. The minute that they set up the, this, this uh, irresponsible caliphate to try and expand their, um, their dominion over, over Muslims, um, they try to look, make themselves look as the victims, that it is you know, us Muslims picking on them. Well, what about the hundreds, if not thousands, of Muslims that they have killed in Syria and in Iraq over the past year and a half? Um, the, the tribes that we have a responsibility to reach out to in eastern Syria and equally as important in western Iraq that have been executed in large numbers over the past year and a half. So this is our war. Uh, and we have a moral responsibility to reach out to, to, to those Muslims to protect them and to stop them before they reach our border. In Syria, are you, are you not inevitably aligned with the Assad government in the sense that if ISIS is your main threat, Winston Churchill said when, you know, he said if Hitler were to invade hell, I would make a common cause with the, with the devil. Do you have to at some level de facto side with Assad? Well, this is part of the confusion when it comes to the international community. I mean, how do you deal with Syria? Because at the moment there's two stories. There's the issue of dealing with the regime and there's the issue of dealing with ISIS or, or, or Daesh. Um, we have always believed in Jordan that there has to be a political solution for Syria. Uh, what has taken prominence at the moment um, is ISIS, uh, Daesh at this stage. So uh, are we trying to chew gum and walk at the same time? And this is something that has to be decided by the international community. We believe that there has to be a political solution that brings um, sort of the moderate forces and, and uh, uh, the, the regime to the table because there is this, this bigger problem. That has not been clarified uh, at, at the moment. So coalition, Arab, Muslim, uh, uh, Western, so to speak, can only do so much in Syria against, against, uh, against ISIS. But at the end of the day, it's got to be the Syrians themselves, especially when you want to reach the heartland of ISIS, which is Raqqa in the north. President Obama has gotten into a little trouble, uh, or at least has uh, ha received some criticism, because he says he doesn't want to call groups like ISIS Islamic extremists, because he doesn't want to give them the mantle of legitimacy uh, by acknowledging that they're uh, Islamic. Do you think he's right? I, I think he is right, and I think this is, uh, this is a, something that has to be understood uh, on a much larger platform, because they're looking for legitimacy that they don't have inside of Islam. Um, you, when we're asked in this debate, you know, are you a moderate or an extremist, um, what these people want is to be called extremist. I mean, they take that as a badge of honor. Uh, if you ask me, am I a moderate or an extremist, I, I'm a Muslim. Um, these people, in the terms that is being used more and more, these uh, in Arabic are called khawarij. These are, in a way, uh, uh, outlaws that are on the fringe of Islam. Um, and and uh, if you look at sort of um, uh, the way that they are actually represented inside of, of, of our religion, they are, these are sort of takfiris. And takfiris in, inside of Sunni Islam, if Sunni Islam is 1.5 uh, uh, billion Muslims, they represent only 1%. Out of that, maybe 200 to 500,000 of these people uh, are actually takfiri jihadists. These are the crazies of this element. So to, to label Islam under the term of extremists and moderates is actually completely wrong. Um, so I think by making this comparison that they're extremist Muslims actually is, is working exactly what these people want. Um, no, we're Muslims. I don't know what these people are, but they definitely do not have any relationship to, to our faith. When Baghdadi, uh, the leader of ISIS, came out with his manifesto, um, even um, extremist organizations completely backed away from what he said. So uh, he has nothing to do uh, with the tenets of, of Islam, which is a, 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 a religion of tolerance that reaches out to other people. How should the West handle this? Should this, the response to ISIS be essentially an Arab response, a Muslim response, or should the West be in, in the lead? This has to be uh, unified. I mean, I've said this to, to uh, leaders uh, both in the Islamic and Arab world and to the world in general. This is uh, a third world war by other means. Uh, this brings Muslims, Christians, uh, other religions together in this generational fight um, that all of us have to be this together. So it's not a, a, a Western fight. Um, this is a fight inside of Islam where everybody comes together against these, these outlaws, so to speak, uh, together. And there's a, a short-term part 
part of this, which is the military part of the issue. There is the medium part, which is the security element of it. And then there's a long term uh, uh, element of this, which is obviously the ideological one. Uh, and that's the one that's the more complicated, the more difficult part. In Sunni Islam, as you know, there is no real priestly hierarchy. There are no, there are no popes or, or, or really anything like that. But there is historically a great weight given to people who have some family association with the Prophet. And the, Hashemite, uh, the Hashemites, your family is regarded uh, as descending from the Prophet. Given that, do you think that when you hear uh, talk, not just from the people in ISIS, but uh, people who, who uh, did the, the things they did in Paris about blasphemy and about the punishments of blasphemy. Do you think that any of this has any basis in Islam? Well, again, it, it, those that are, are trying to use, um, um, uh, um, there's a difference, and I'm sure we can get into this, uh, between freedom of speech and, and hate speech. Um, so uh, both Rania and I uh, were president in Paris uh, because it was the right thing to do, to stand up against violence and, 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 and terrorism. But we were also there in Paris to stand uh, in the name of uh, a young Muslim policeman by the name of Ahmed, who was the first policeman to be at the scene of that crime, who paid with his life defending the laws of France. Um, we were there to also defend uh, uh, those innocents that were killed in the name of Islam, uh, whether it was the 150-odd the school children that were killed in a, in a school in Pakistan, whether it was uh, you know, the thousands that were killed in a Nigerian village in, in a single day, or the thousands of Muslims that are being killed every day in Syria and, and, and in Iraq. So the issue of, 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 the, of, of the blasphemy, if anybody understood the Prophet, may peace be upon him, and how he used to look at life. He, he was persecuted at, at, at the beginning of, of bringing Islam uh, together. And he always forgave. There were some brutal things that happened to him, to his family, and he always forgave those around him. So for these extremists now to be able to sort of be the defenders of, 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 of his, his, his honor, when they don't understand who he was, I find so in insulting in a way because he would have always forgiven. But that's not what they want to do. They want to create that hatred. Uh, the, my, my brother, um, His Holiness the Pope, again spoke out that, you know, um, the the sort of uh, vilifying of, of, of religions is something that we all have to stand, uh, stand together. And then you see this, the good stories that unfortunately are not reported enough in the media. So when you, when you look at uh, what's happened over the past several months when, um, uh, when people in, or, or extremists in, in Sweden uh, went and sort of, sort of painted insulting graffiti on, on a, a mosque's door um, in, in, in the city in Sweden, um, the Swedish people came out and, and put paper hearts on the door of that mosque. In, in Cologne, when Islamophobic groups went out um, uh, chanting against Islam, uh, the great cathedral of Cologne turned out its lights in, prote in protest against that. Uh, last week, uh, young Muslims in Oslo uh, held hands around a synagogue to show a ring of peace. These are the messages that we're all united together against this fight uh, and, and not to fall into the trap that the extremists want on either side to create hate between religions. That's what we have to concentrate on. Your Majesty, people are uh, puzzled about the way ISIS seems to be able to finance itself, the sophistication of its media operation, but let's start with the money. Um, how do they have so much cash? Well, um, th money it does get supplied by, by individuals um, uh, uh, in our part of the world. Uh, and you've seen uh, sort of a UN resolution recently to try and uh, move as the international community to make sure that those accesses are, are, are cut off. You've also got to remember that um, uh, ISIS was fairly successful in taking over territory, whether it was in Syria and more recently in Iraq, where they overran banks and managed actually to capture uh, a lot of money. And then they ran their own economic industry. So they were selling a lot of oil, um, producing about a billion dollars worth of revenue a year. That's been degraded quite significantly since because of, of coalition airstrikes. But they had their own ability to run their own economy quite successfully. Do you think that uh, defeating ISIS will require or should uh, require uh, American boots on the ground, American ground forces? 
Well, look, um, I, I, I think that uh, a lot of us are looking at this, that um, it being sort of uh, our fight, uh, an Arab Muslim challenge, um, that uh, trying to keep Western boots off the ground is, is I think, uh, an essential uh, part of, of how we move forward. Um, and I think this is why most of us are looking at it the, uh, that way. Uh, at the end of the day... Uh, why? Do you think it would, it would be, no, it would be mean, a gift it, to I ISIS mean, to have I, we, we, No, we're looking at it. Well, I mean, that, that could be an element of it, because I, I think sort of the, the, the perception that they will use as occupation is, 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 a, is a wrong issue. They will obviously always use the idea of this is a crusade, which is not, because it is actually this is our fight. Um, but at the same time, when you look at and you look at also uh, Iraq, it's the integrity of, of, and the sovereignty of those countries. Um, it, it has to be the Syrians dealing with their, their issues and Iraqis dealing with theirs. That doesn't mean that they can't be aided by, by air, possibly special forces type of operations in the future. But those are things that are being looked at. What is, I think, more important is to look at uh, the challenges in a holistic approach. And I think this is the challenge for 2015, where the fixation today is obviously on Iraq and Syria. We can't forget the problems of Sinai, we can't forget the problems of Libya, and we must not forget the challenges to um, Africa of Boko Haram, Shabab, um, and the problems that um, these franchises, so, so to speak, um, are presenting to, to Asia. So like-minded countries, Arab, Muslim, and the rest of the community need to come together um, and sort of own up to how we can share responsibilities, work together, and deal with these problems in a holistic approach. Do you think that Prime Minister Netanyahu has genuinely been make, making an effort to create a two-state solution to the Palestinian problem? At this stage, um, n nothing um, proactive will happen uh, from either side, unfortunately, until we get past um, the elections. Uh, my hope is that once we get past the elections, there is a serious commitment from both sides to move on the two-state solution. Uh, and the reason is, if this is our uh, generational fight against um, these uh, uh, Khawarij, these uh, uh, outlaws of Islam, um, we have been talking about this global threat. What these people use as one of their main recruiting uh, issues rightly or wrongly, because the Israelis will say that these problems got nothing to do with us um, and, and get upset sometimes when I say that all roads lead to Jerusalem, is that they use this as an argument. So we saw that the spike in recruiting in, uh, in the summer when uh, uh, the war in Gaza happened and 700 women and children uh, died as a result. Um, foreign fighters flocked to Syria and to Iraq because of what they perceive as the injustice of the Palestinians. Uh, and, and of Jerusalem. So if we're going to have any chance of winning this generational fight, this third world war by other means, if we can't fix this Israeli-Palestinian problem, this, um, um, this ongoing situation has been there for many decades, then we have at least one hand tied behind our backs if we're going to deal with this. And so this is the challenge to both the Israeli and Palestinian leadership. You've got to understand that now this problem has been, become much bigger than yourselves. How are we going to be able to win this? How are we going to be able to justify us Muslims with the rest of the international community fighting against these people if this thing keeps bubbling? That's the major challenge, I think. Your Majesty, pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank you.